Welcome back everyone to chapter five of biology. In this chap, excuse me, in this video, we're going to start talking about specific types of membrane transport. Now that, given what we talked about in the previous video, now that we have a pretty solid foundation in the structure of the plasma membrane, and we understand at this point that, okay, the plasma membrane, it's not a brick wall. It's not there to completely uh, prevent anything from moving through the membrane to get from the inside of the cell out or vice versa, we can start talking about how materials are transported across the membrane and what sort of rules they follow in order to do so. This video is going to cover passive transport, which is the first of three transport processes we are going to talk about. Okay, so you'll recall in the last video, the term that we use to describe the membrane is we say it is selectively permeable. So what that means is that certain molecules can freely pass through the membrane, while on the other hand, other types of molecules or materials cannot do so unless they have some sort of assistance. So we're not saying that there are certain molecules or materials that just can never, ever, ever pass through the membrane. We're just saying that certain molecules can go through the membrane without any sort of assistance, while others are going to need some sort of assistance. Now, what kind of form that assistant takes is something that we'll cover here pretty soon. So let's discuss the factors that determine solute permeability. So basically, what determines whether a molecule can freely pass through or whether it's going to need some assistance. Now the first one is a little bit of common sense. You need to consider how big your solute particle is. So the idea here is that if a molecule or a particle of some kind is going to pass straight through the membrane without any assistance whatsoever, it has to go through the phospholipid bilayer. So it's going to have to be small enough to squeeze in between those neighboring phospholipids, get through the hydrophobic core, and then pop out on the other side. So the idea here is that you want your particle to be as small as possible if it's going to pass straight through. Large particles, for obvious reasons, are going to have difficulty squeezing through those narrow gaps that are in between adjacent phospholipids. The next property we need to consider is the polarity of the molecule. Now, the thing we need to consider here is the hydrophobic core of the phospholipid bilayer. Now, we use that term hydrophobic, and by now I'm sure you know what that means. The hydrophobic core does not like what? Water. Well, here is the dirty little secret. Not only do those nonpolar fatty acid tails not like water, <clears throat> They also don't like anything that resembles water, and by that we mean polar molecules. So water is polar, those hydrophobic tails don't like water, well those hydrophobic tails are not going to like anything else that is also polar. So the idea here is that nonpolar molecules are going to have an easy time passing through the membrane, while polar molecules are going to have difficulties. So the more polar a molecule is, the less and less able it is going to be able to get through the membrane all by itself. So, so far, if you're trying to draw up the perfect kind of molecule that goes straight through the membrane with no problem whatsoever, you want it to be small, you want it to be nonpolar. If it's a larger molecule that has polarity to it, it's going to have a lot of trouble getting through. And then finally, number three here is basically just kind of an extreme extension of number two, talking about whether molecules have an electrical charge to them. Now, this one's pretty easy to understand. Polarity, as we saw back in chapter two, is a case of a molecule having partial positive and partial negative charges to it. And that is the essence of why those hydrophobic tails don't like polar molecules. Well, this is an even more extreme example. With this, we're talking about molecules that have full electrical charges, whether positive or negative. The hydrophobic tails are really, really not gonna like that. So any kind of particle or molecule that has a full electrical charge, it will be totally prevented from passing through the membrane. There is no possible way for anything that has a full electrical charge to pass straight through the membrane uninhibited. Now, polar molecules, 
may be able to get through, but they would do so with a lot of difficulty. Anything that has a full electrical charge, no way, no how, it's not getting through the membrane, at least not without some assistance. So if you look at this picture here, you can see everything that we just talked about uh, pretty well illustrated. So you can see these electrically charged molecules and ions are going to be repelled by that hydrophobic core. So they're going to stay on this side of the membrane unless they get some assistance. A big macromolecule that is very, very, very large is not going to be passing through because it can't squeeze in between those neighboring phospholipids. A polar molecule like water, even though it's very small, is not going to be able to pass through unless it has an open channel to let it through. And that is the nature of the assistance that we are talking about. You'll recall on the previous video, we talked about carrier and channel proteins providing said assistance and allowing hydrophilic solutes to pass through the membrane without having to interact with that hydrophobic core. Now the one example here you can see of a molecule just passing straight through the membrane without any sort of assistance. This is a relatively small molecule, has no electrical charge, has no polarity. So for those three reasons, it can pass straight through the membrane by squeezing in between those phospholipids. Because this molecule is nonpolar itself, there is no objection from the perspective of the nonpolar hydrophobic tails. They don't mind that so much, so they allow it to go straight through. Now, one thing I should say in the case of this macromolecule here, we talked about polar and electrically charged molecules not being able to get through on their own unless they have some assistance. Well, that doesn't really apply to very big macromolecules. There's not really a way for channel and carrier proteins to allow them through. So what we're going to see in the last video of this chapter is that molecules that are very, very, very large, the only way they're going to pass through is via a separate mechanism, which is called bulk transport. So for now, if you're dealing with a very large molecule like a protein here don't worry about that for now we will cover at the end of the chapter how those sorts of things get through the membrane so like we said here cations and anions like these positively and negatively charged particles that you can see here they can't pass through the membrane because of their electrical charge so if they're going to get through we need to have a channel protein to let them through kind of similar to what you're seeing here with water so again, water ordinarily wouldn't be able to pass through because it is a very polar molecule in spite of being a very small molecule. But what you will kind of see as you continue in through your reading is that a lot of cells have what are called water channels, which are more appropriately called aquaporin channels. These are channel proteins that are in the membrane that are specifically dedicated to allowing water to bypass the hydrophobic core. So really, it's not really a consideration of, oh, can water get through? Is the assistance there? In most cases, you can assume the assistance is there because most cells have these aquaporin channels. And then as we saw, a nonpolar small substrate is going to be able to pass straight through because it has no problems interacting with the hydrophobic core. Okay, so let's start talking about passive transport. So passive transport is going to basically describe molecules, whether they get through all by themselves or don't get through all by themselves, passing through the membrane without an energy requirement. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about here. So the question becomes, okay, well, for what reason would a molecule want to move across the membrane? Why and how and when would that ever happen? So let's discuss the force the physical force that is going to attract molecules to make that journey from one side of the membrane to another so solutes and keep in mind solutes can refer to any sort of molecule that's in an aqueous medium so that could be sodium potassium glucose oxygen gas carbon dioxide gas those sorts of things Solutes get drawn across the membrane from areas of high concentration towards areas of lower concentration. So this direction of flow is called a concentration gradient. Okay, let's take a step back here and explain what we mean by all that. Take a look at this situation that we have here. You've got a phospholipid bilayer, and we're looking at this solute that is represented by these little blue hexagons. 
at the beginning of the scenario, all of these particles are on one side of the membrane and none of them are on the opposite side of the membrane. This is what we mean by a concentration gradient. There is an inequality in terms of how many particles are on one side of the membrane versus another. So we would say that this up here is an area of high concentration, so a high number of particles per volume of solvent versus the bottom scenario where we have practically no particles in an equal volume of solvent. So very high concentration up here, very low concentration down here. So the idea here is that solutes are going to want to move from this cramped high area of concentration towards the area where there are not as many particles and they're going to have kind of more room to spread out. So the solutes that move down their concentration gradient, so from high to low, I'm going to use the terminology moving down a concentration gradient to indicate we're going from high to low concentration. This process is called simple diffusion. When a particle moves down the concentration gradient by just going through the membrane all by themselves, we call that simple diffusion. So simple diffusion is a part of a larger transport process that I mentioned before, which is called passive transport. So simple diffusion is just one of two diff different ways that passive transport can occur. So passive transport describes any sort of process by which solutes move down their gradient, regardless of whether assistance is required or not. And because these molecules are moving down their gradient, kind of going downhill, no energy should be required. So the cell does not have to expend any energy in order for passive transport to occur. That's something very important to consider here. So the two types of passive transport we're going to see, we just talked about simple diffusion in which solutes move freely across the membrane, meaning they don't require assistance in the form of a channel or a carrier protein. And in the next few slides, we're going to see some more specific examples of that. And then a future type of passive transport that we'll talk about towards the end of this video called facilitated diffusion. It's the exact same principle of solutes moving down their concentration gradient. But in these cases, we're talking about molecules that cannot make it through the membrane all by themselves for whatever reason, whether they're polar or electrically charged. So in those cases of facilitated diffusion, the presence of a channel or carrier protein is necessary. You've got to have the assistance there. But the important thing to consider is regardless of which of these two types of passive transport you're talking about, neither one of them requires energy, even though in the case of facilitated diffusion, even though assistance is necessary, that does not mean energy is necessary. Okay, so let's talk about simple diffusion a little bit more. We can actually see a beautiful case of simple diffusion in uh, action even without the presence of a membrane. Consider this fishbowl. Imagine that you take a, a solid crystal that consists of a purple dye, maybe a purple food coloring or something like that, and you toss it in the bottom of the fishbowl, which initially just had clear water in it. Over time, you can start to see the dye molecules spreading out until eventually, after an indeterminate amount of time of waiting on this to happen, eventually the water in the fishbowl is just going to be completely purple. Okay, let's back up here. When we go to the beginning of the scenario, all of the dye molecules are concentrated in a singular point or a singular area. They are all a part of a crystal. So the concentration of these dye particles would be extremely high right here, whereas the concentration of dye is extremely low everywhere else. In fact, the concentration is zero everywhere else. So what we learned from talking about simple diffusion and passive transport is that these dye molecules want to move from the area of high concentration, which is where they're a part of the crystal, and they want to spread out to areas of lower concentration. So these dye molecules are going to start moving away from the crystal and towards where the clear water is. So over time, you can start to see these dye molecules spreading out in all direction. We call that spreading out diffusion or diffusing until eventually, and it's not exactly clear right now how long we would have to wait for this to happen, 
eventually these dye particles are going to spread out completely until the concentration of dye particles is equal in every single part of the water that's in the fishbowl. Meaning, if we were to take separate samples of every single area in the fishbowl, we would find that the concentration of dye is equal in every single sample. So this situation we end up in here where the concentration is equal in all areas and we no longer have a concentration gradient, the terminology we use for that is equilibrium. We would say the dye has reached equilibrium and that now there's no longer a concentration gradient compelling it to spread out anymore. Okay, let's talk about a more biological example. This is something that we as humans and other mammals and other breathing organisms do on a daily basis and a minute-by-minute -minute basis. So we're talking about respiration in the lungs. So how do we pull oxygen out of the air and into our bloodstream so that we can deliver that oxygen to cells all throughout the body? The importance of this is actually something we're going to talk a lot about when we get to chapter uh, 7, I think it is, on cellular respiration. So basically the idea here is that we are looking at a portion of the lung tissue called the alveoli. The alveoli are made of extremely thin membranes, extremely thin cell membranes. And it's this interface that you can see right here. So you can see that thin membrane of the alveolus there. And then you can see a thin membrane that makes up a capillary blood vessel here. So the idea here is that we want these oxygen molecules that are on the inside of this air sac in the lungs. So when you breathe in, you're inflating those air sacs so they fill up with oxygen and other gases. The idea here is we want these oxygen molecules to freely diffuse across these cell membranes so that they can enter the bloodstream and now that oxygen can be carried through the bloodstream and delivered to all tissues throughout the body. So in this picture, we're looking specifically at oxygen, but the same would also apply to carbon dioxide. These gas molecules are going to cross these membranes by simple diffusion. Again, they do it by simple diffusion because they are small and nonpolar molecules, and they do so in opposite directions. So the oxygen is at a high concentration here inside the alveolus, and it's at a relatively low concentration here inside the bloodstream. So oxygen is going to want to move from its area of high concentration here towards its area of lower concentration here. And since this uh, blood is always moving away from where it is currently positioned, there's always going to be a concentration gradient compelling oxygen to leave the inside of the air sac and get into the bloodstream. So we're constantly replenishing the amount of oxygen that's in the blood. Carbon dioxide is going to have an opposite concentration gradient Again, you can't really see it here, but there's a lot of carbon dioxide built up in the bloodstream and not much of it here in the alveolus. So the carbon dioxide would move the opposite direction and that is the mechanism by which we rid our body of excess carbon dioxide by breathing it out once this simple diffusion process completes. Okay, so now that we've talked about that, let's talk about some factors that actually affect how quickly these diffusion processes occur. This is related to a physical law which is called Fick's Law of Diffusion. So the first thing to consider is how steep is the concentration gradient. By how steep the gradient is, I mean how big is the difference in concentration across the cell membrane. If there is a billion particles on one side of the membrane and one particle on the other side of the membrane, we would call that an extremely steep gradient. And in those cases, the billion molecules are really going to be moving fast to get to the other side. In a separate scenario, if there are a billion and one particles on one side of the membrane and only a billion on the other, well, that's not much of a concentration gradient. That's an extremely flat concentration gradient. Technically, it isn't gradient because there is one more molecule on one side compared to the other, but the consequence is that the rate of diffusion is going to be very slow. Those molecules on the left are not exactly going to be rushing to the right to correct a difference of only one molecule. Number two is the mass of the solute 
we don't need to talk about this one too much. It's kind of common sense. Really heavy molecules are going to move very slowly as opposed to very light molecules, which are gonna move a lot faster. The temperature of the solution, whether it's air or liquid, molecules are going to move a lot faster at higher temperatures because they have more what we call kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion. As you crank up the temperature, molecules start moving a lot faster, so clearly diffusion processes would start happening faster as well if you start heating things up. On the other hand, if you are dealing with solutions that are very cold, then those molecules are not going to be moving fast and diffusion processes will slow down. The density of the solvent is something to consider as well. So if you're dealing with a solvent that is very, very, very dense and maybe viscous, kind of like uh, maple syrup or molasses, that's going to slow down diffusion. So a good example of this in physiological terms is that when we become dehydrated, our bodily fluids become very dense because you have less water and you have more solutes so diffusion processes start to suffer so there's more to dehydration than just not having enough water solute permeability is something that we talked about before so we talked about this in the sense that as molecules become larger and more polar their diffusion greatly slows down whereas as molecules become smaller and less polar the diffusion starts to get faster. The surface area of the membrane is something, of course, we need to consider, and we talked about this a great deal back in chapter four. It's generally in the cell's best interest to maximize the surface area to volume ratio. And another way of kind of thinking about this in diffusion terms is that the more surface area a membrane has in terms of its cell membrane, the more opportunities there are for diffusion to occur. With less surface area, there are limited spaces for which diffusion can occur across. And then finally, we need to consider the distance traveled. So it goes without saying, a diffusion process is going to be rather slow if the solute has to really travel a very far way to get to where it's going. It's no different than how you kind of plan uh, a road trip. If you have to travel very far, you're not going to get to your destination very quickly at all. Okay, so now that we've talked about simple diffusion, let's start talking about facilitated diffusion. As a reminder, this is still a type of passive transport, so we're still talking about molecules moving down their concentration gradient. The only real difference here is that we're now talking about molecules that require the presence of a channel or a carrier protein because they are either electrically charged or they are too polar to get through the membrane all by themselves. So as you can kind of see here in this picture, we have a clear concentration gradient for these kind of smaller green hexagon particles. So in order for them to move down their concentration gradient, they have to be able to move through this protein channel that is inserted into the plasma membrane directly. If this channel was not here, these molecules would be very unlikely to be able to move down their concentration gradient. So they would just kind of be stuck on this side over here. So regardless of whether we're dealing with a carrier protein or a channel protein, and in general, it's not always the case, but in general, carrier proteins are going to be for slightly larger, kind of more polar solutes, and channel proteins are going to be for kind of more small electrically charged solutes like ions, but regardless of which one you're talking about, the essence of how they work and how they provide their assistance is they allow the solute particle to pass through the membrane without having to interact with that hydrophobic core. If you look at this channel protein here, if you think of it as kind of like a little tunnel that goes straight through the membrane, these molecules can just move straight through the tunnel and they have no idea that the hydrophobic tails are on the other side and the same thing goes for the hydrophobic tails. They have no idea that there's some undesirable polar molecule moving through on the other side. So to make sure that we really understand the difference between simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion, let's start with how they are actually similar. In both cases, 
We are dealing with molecules that exist at a high concentration on one side of the membrane, and we want them to move across the membrane to get towards an area of lower concentration. So in both cases, because the uh, direction of the concentration gradient and the movement is from high to low, there will not be any energy required. So for simple diffusion, we're talking about a molecule that is able to move through the membrane freely and directly without a channel or a carrier being necessary. In the case of facilitated diffusion, which again, we're talking about polar molecules, electrically charged molecules, these molecules have a concentration gradient and they want to move across the membrane, but the only way they can do so is if there is a channel or a carrier that allows them passage through without having to interact with the hydrophobic core. So I think at this point you get the idea of how channel proteins work. Again, they are essentially little tunnels that allow molecules to go straight through. Carrier proteins work in a very similar way, except they take a little bit more of an active approach in the sense that carrier proteins have to actually form fit the solute and change shape to wedge those molecules out onto the other side. So in this case, you can see that the actual shape of the protein has to go through several different changes as it brings in the molecule from one side and releases it on the other side. So like I said, carrier proteins are generally going to be for slightly larger molecules like sugars, not as big as a protein or a nucleic acid or anything like that, but certainly bigger than what a channel protein is going to work with, which is usually going to be water and electrically charged particles like ions. Okay, so now let's talk about a very specialized form of facilitated diffusion. This is called osmosis. Osmosis refers to a situation in which we are specifically talking about water moving through the membrane by facilitated diffusion. So don't forget, water does so by moving through the aquaporin channel. So water is no different than any other polar molecule in the sense that it requires assistance, and it gets that from the aquaporin channels. But the reason why this is such a unique case to think about is because water is not a solute. Water is your solvent. So it's not that necessarily the principles or the fundamentals here have changed. It's different to think about just because you're considering the movement of a solvent rather than a solute. So you kind of have to change your way of thinking here. So what we're going to see is that osmosis, the movement of water across the membrane, this is only going to occur in which in situations in which water can move across the membrane, and that is going to be determined by whether aquaporin channels are present, but at least one solute or solutes cannot move across the membrane. So think about that for just a minute. Pause the video if you need to, but just think about that third statement there. This only occurs in situations in which water can move across the membrane, but your solutes cannot. So only when the solvent can move, but not the solutes. Okay, so what we're gonna see here is that in these situations, water will move from areas of low solute concentration to areas of high solute concentration. Now your initial impression might be, well, that sounds like we're moving uphill rather than downhill. Didn't you, you're probably thinking, well, didn't you say we want passive transport and that includes facilitated diffusion? Didn't you say we want molecules to move from high concentration to low concentration? You're correct about that, but this is no different and here's why. When we said solutes want to move from high to low concentration, we were talking about solutes. In this case, we're not talking about solutes, we're talking about the solvent. So if water, the solvent, moves from low solute concentration to high solute concentration, that is no different. So think about this. If a solution has a very low solute concentration, meaning it doesn't really have a whole lot of particles in it, what does that say about the relative water concentration? Well, a, a solution that doesn't have much stuff in it probably, by comparison, has a lot of water in it. Whereas a solution that has a lot of stuff in it and it has a high solute concentration, it probably has less water by comparison as well. So the way we're gonna kind of think about this is that water is moving from high water concentration to low water concentration, 
but you're not usually going to be talking about solutions in terms of water concentration. You're going to be thinking about it in terms of solute concentration. So the same principles and rules are being followed here. We're just having to kind of change our way of thinking. So water is going to move from areas of low solute concentration. Again, that means high water concentration to areas of high solute concentration. And again, that's synonymous with low water concentration. So when cells have to deal with this, with the potential for water to move across the membrane, they start to develop something called osmotic pressure, which describes the forces that the osmosis places on the cell membrane as water is always pressurizing the membrane, moving back and forth due to osmosis. Okay. It's possible at this point you may feel a little bit confused, and that's okay. So we're going to clear that up right now. So all the rules that we laid out, we're going to apply them here. So consider this situation on the left. So we've got a beaker, and this red dotted line is meant to be a semi-permeable membrane. So it's meant to be kind of a facsimile of the cell membrane. So this semi-permeable membrane is splitting this beaker into two different chambers. Let's call them A and B. So on either side of the membrane in chamber A and chamber B, they both contain a simple solution that contains only one solute, that's those little purple circles there, and then water as the solvent. So each of these chambers contains a certain volume of water with a certain number of these purple solute molecules mixed in. So if you consider the before picture here, which chamber has the higher solute concentration? If you said that chamber B has the higher solute concentration, you are absolutely correct. So both chambers have the same volume of solvent, but chamber B clearly has more solute particles, so it has the higher concentration. Whereas chamber A has fewer solute particles and it has a lower concentration. Okay, so now let's take that and flip it around. Let's think about it in terms of water concentration. So the idea here is that because chamber B has the higher solute concentration, it therefore has the lower water concentration. And the same goes for chamber A. Because it has the lower solute concentration, it has the higher water. So the question we really want to ask here is based on what we see, which direction is water going to want to move? And remember, water moves from high water to low water, low sol solute to high solute. So what we're going to see here is that water will move from the left side of the chamber where water is more concentrated towards the right chamber, chamber B, where water is less concentrated. So you can see that that must be the case here because the uh, amount of solution in chamber A has drastically decreased and the amount of solution in chamber B has drastically increased. Now the question here is, based on what you see, have the number of solute particles in chamber A and chamber B changed from the before picture to the after picture? And the answer is no. Let's start with chamber A. We can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven solute particles in chamber A in the before picture, and we can count seven of them in chamber A after. And we're not going to bother counting for chamber B, but we can go ahead and assume that it's the same in that case as well. So what this tells us is that we have a situation in which these purple molecules are not able to cross the membrane. So the membrane will not let them pass, but because the membrane is permeable to water, the water is what moves across the membrane and not the solute. So that brings us back to this statement here. Again, we said osmosis will only occur in situations in which water can move, but the solute in question cannot. So if we reconsider this in the before picture, we've got a clear concentration gradient in which the purple molecules want to move from chamber B to chamber A, high to low, but because they cannot move across the membrane, they are unable to do so. So in order to alleviate this concentration gradient, water, which can move through the membrane, moves from chamber A to chamber B, dilutes the molecules in chamber B, and concentrates the molecules in chamber A, 
so that we achieve a concentration equality, we call that equilibrium, between chamber A and chamber B. Now, of course, we do that at the expense of having much less total solution in chamber A versus chamber B, but you can tell the concentrations between chamber A and chamber B now are equal because the molecules are equally spaced out. Before, chamber B had all the molecules all scrunched together, and in chamber A, they were all pretty far apart, but now because they're all relatively evenly spaced apart, we can say the concentration must be the same. Now, if this were a situation in which these purple molecules could move across the membrane, then osmosis would not occur because these molecules could just follow their concentration gradients by themselves. There would be no reason for water to move because the particles can move. The only reason osmosis does occur here is because these particles cannot move, but water can. Okay, so the next uh, step for osmosis is we need to talk about tonicity. Basically, we're talking about the consequences of osmosis occurring when it does occur. So tonicity is something that describes the effect a certain solution will have on a living cell. So in order to help us predict when and how osmosis will occur, we like to keep track of total solute concentration in a solution. The term we use for this is called osmolarity. So whether you're talking about the uh, fluid outside of a cell, which we call intracellular fluid, or inside of a cell, which we call intracellular fluid, and the fluid outside the cell, which we call the extracellular fluid, if the total solute concentration or osmolarity is equal in both places, meaning that the water concentration must be equal in both places, then there should be no net osmosis occurring, and we would say the extracellular solution would be isotonic to the cell. So if no water leaves or enters the cell by osmosis, it must be in an isotonic solution. Now, in a separate scenario where the osmolarity is higher in the intracellular fluid than it is in the extracellular fluid, meaning there's a higher water concentration outside the cell than there is inside the cell, the extracellular fluid solution is said to be hypotonic to the cell. This describes a situation in which water is going to rush from outside the cell to inside the cell, and this is going to cause the volume of solution inside the cell to increase, and that's going to potentially strain the plasma membrane. The cell will start to swell, and the cell may burst or go through what is called lysis. And then the third scenario is one in which the osmolarity is lower in the intracellular fluid than it is in the extracellular fluid. So there's, more, there's a higher water concentration inside the cell than out. This is going to cause water to start to leave the cell by osmosis, and that can cause the cell to kind of start to shrivel up because it's losing water. That process is called crenation, and in this case, the extracellular solution would said to be hypertonic to the cell. So these terms that we've introduced here, hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic, are used based on the observations you make of what a solution does to a cell when you place that cell in that particular solution. So if the extracellular solution you place a cell into causes water to rush out and the cells start shriveling up or crenating, that solution you just place the cell into is hypertonic in nature. If the opposite occurs and water starts to enter the cell by osmosis, then that solution must be hypotonic. And then finally, the more desirable situation in most cases is that you want to expose cells to an isotonic solution in which the health and integrity of the cells should not change because no net osmosis is occurring. And we can tell no net osmosis is occurring because the rate of water entry into the cell is exactly matched by the rate of water exit by the cell. The reason why we're looking at red blood cells here is because that is the most common application of tonicity principles when you get into healthcare settings. When patients are in hospitals and clinics, they often receive IV fluids that are ported directly into their bloodstreams. Since you're introducing a foreign solution into a bodily fluid, that solution has the potential to change the osmolarity of the bloodstream, and that can potentially cause problems for the cells that are in the bloodstream, namely the red blood cells.
So to kind of make sure we understand this, let's consider two separate scenarios that have to do with tonicity. Number one, a nurse gives a patient an IV that just contains pure water. So it's a bag that contains pure water and we're basically introducing pure water into that patient's bloodstream. And number two, you go out into your garden and you water your plants with pure water. Now the question I wanna ask here is which one of these scenarios produces a bad result and why? So take a minute to think about it, pause the video if you need to, and then let's come back and talk about it. Okay, so only one of these scenarios is actually bad, and it is scenario number one. If a nurse gives a patient an IV of pure water, introducing just solvent to the bloodstream without introducing any new solutes, that is going to cause the osmolarity of the bloodstream, the blood plasma, the extracellular fluid, to go down. So you're introducing more solvent, so the concentration of solute in the blood goes down and the osmolarity comes down. So in doing so, you are creating a hypotonic environment for the red blood cells, and all that extra water that's in the bloodstream is going to rush inside of the red blood cells by osmosis, and that's going to cause a lot of the red blood cells to rupture. And since red blood cells carry oxygen throughout the body, the person in question here is going to be in dire straits because the cells in his or her body are not going to be getting enough oxygen. But number two here is not a bad situation. Why is that? So isn't it exactly the same thing? We're watering plant cells with a hypotonic solution. So let's talk about why that is actually not so bad. We need to reconsider the difference between a plant cell and an animal cell. Plant cells are surrounded by a cell wall. The cell wall is a rigid structure made of cellulose that surrounds and encapsulates the cell membrane, and basically it will prevent lysis even when a plant cell is exposed to a hypotonic solution. You can't rupture the plasma membrane if you have a rigid structure on the outside. You, you actually end up creating a type of pressure inside the plant cell called turgor pressure, which actually helps the plant to prevent wilting, and it actually drives what's called cytoplasmic streaming, the sharing of water through plasmodesmosis Another structure that plant cells have that prevent ly uh, lysis in this case is that plant cells have a central vacuole. This is an organelle that helps to store additional water, among other things. So providing plant cells with too much water is actually not too much of an issue because rather than causing the plasma membrane to stretch out too much, a lot of that water gets self-contained within that central vacuole. So between the cell wall, the vacuole, and the plasmodesmata that, that uh, fac facilitates uh, cytoplasmic streaming, plant cells are extremely resistant to lysis, so watering your plants with a hypotonic solution like pure water is actually perfectly okay. But because animal cells do not have these mechanisms in place, our cells, as animal cells, are highly, highly susceptible to cell lysis. So in most cases, when nurses give IVs in hospitals, they give IV solutions that are isotonic in nature and will not cause any problems for the cells that are in the blood. So this brings up an important concept called osmoregulation. This comes back to the homeostasis principle we talked about all the way back in chapter one. The idea that the cells in the body need to be able to regulate themselves to make sure that certain things don't change too terribly much. So all organisms have to have this osmoregulation in place to prevent cells from taking on too much water or losing too much water and lysing or crenating. So one potential way of doing this is that you can add solutes to your extracellular fluids by eating. So you add sugar, salts, and proteins by the food that you eat, and then you can remove excess solutes by various excretion methods, whether that's urination or defecation, Water can be added to the extracellular fluid by drinking water, and then excess water can be removed by regulation of the kidneys, basically how much you pee in any given day. You're probably aware that if you drink a big old bottle of water, you're going to be running to the restroom after not too terribly long because you've introduced too much water into your bloodstream. Okay, so that was a very long video, so thanks for sticking with me here. 
The next few videos should be quite a bit shorter. So in the next video, we're going to talk about active transport and consider cases where solutes do not move from high concentration to low concentration. They do not go downhill, but maybe they go uphill instead. So there's going to be some fundamental differences that we will need to talk about. Well, thanks again, and I will see you in the next video.